to many bodies. Yeah, so, um, so, so this, uh, this work involved uh, many people. Uh, um, oh, you need the mic. Oh, I have to have the mic? Okay. You have to have the mic, otherwise we... Which, there are two mics. The more mics, the merrier. So I should have them both, and maybe put one of them next to the speaker. <laughs> <laughs> one of them on the speaker, one of them. Oh, okay. Better? All right. Yes. So, um, yeah, so, so this work involved many people. Um, uh, in particular, uh, um, our two postdocs, uh, Watson uh, and, and Alex, as, as well as uh, Yao. The, the, it's also collaborative uh, between groups, between uh, Jens uh, Koch, on, uh, who did a lot of the theory on the first two projects, and, and, the, and the last part is a tight collaboration uh, between Don and I. Um, so uh, I, at the beginning now, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, just quantum circuits, just because there are some AMO folks in the audience. Uh, uh, we'll talk a little bit about um, multi-mode uh, uh, circuit QED, um, and most of this part part will be kind of a little bit maybe quantum computing focused for this uh, for this meeting. But but I think part of the reason I wanted to talk about it was to actually maybe generate some ideas for for ways we could think about about this in, in kind of a more many body context. Um, uh, I'll also talk about how we do cavity stabilization of, of qubits and how we can use that as a tool then to try to make uh, a strongly interacting uh, uh, many body system, uh, in this case uh, a modulator. Um, and then I'll, I'll have, a, I'll just quickly show some of the other stuff we're doing and, uh, and, and hopefully and maybe put up some questions for first to meet. So, so this is Watson and Alex, uh, who are postdocs and we'll probably be looking for jobs soon and are excellent. And this is uh, Yao, who, and I mean, many of the people contribute, but these are sort of the main actors. Um, okay, so just to, you know, in terms of context for this workshop, so um, a lot of these ideas kind of came out of this idea of, of just trying to have um, making metamaterials with photons, using photons as the medium of the interacting bodies rather than atoms or spins or, or, or electrons. And uh, you know, photons, uh, as we've heard throughout the workshop, have, have many, uh, many nice properties. And in particular, if you if, if you use microwave photons, uh, they're also quite nice. Uh, uh, I think Andrew actually did a great job uh, uh, kind of explaining this. And and so you can have flexible t topologies of, of, of things. You can have uh, uh, very strong interactions. Uh, and and also we can you know uh, we can actually really. Basically, extract everything you could want to know about the system. So we can, you know, we can look at every single site. We can, uh, with perfect resolution, we can we can look at it uh, on timescales much faster than, than any of the dynamics. So we can really get just about 
anything you, you could hope to get out of it. Um, and so I'm not going to talk about these very much. I, I think John will mention them um, in his talk. But uh, one of the things that got John and I talking was just trying to understand. Well, I was really trying to understand his work that uh, will probably be the main subject of his talk on, on, on using visible photons in twisted cavities. And, and I didn't understand what he was talking about. And probably neither will you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. You, you'll understand perfectly. Um, but the, the, you know, and so a lot of this work actually grew out of sort of trying to explain this in, in, in a language that I can understand, and that language was the language of, of uh, cavity QED, so it's sort of appropriate for, for this workshop. And, and in doing that, you know, we, uh, we sort of mapped it onto cavity QED, and then we tried to map it to circuits. And then when we did that, we found that the numbers were actually quite good, and, and so we actually started to do these experiments together. Um, so this was one example. It's a, you know, a topological insulator. Um, and it's, it's, you know, these are both room temperature objects right now that, you know, this is a, an FR4 circuit board with like lumped element like capacitors and, and, and inductors. And, and this is just a piece of aluminum that we milled out and put some, some little Yig spheres in there. Um, so the physics, you know, at this point is still, is, is, has non-trivial topology, but is, but is classical. <coughs> Uh, and what we're trying to do now is, uh, is to really move towards uh, strongly interacting uh, physics. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll kind of talk mostly about that aspect. Um, so I just wanted to kind of remind people what the, the main sort of components that we have are. Um, so the first, I, 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 you know, us Kevin QED people are quantum optical people, we're, we're simple people. We, we really only understand two objects, right? The, the LC circuit, or, or for us, or, or you know, uh, a harmonic oscillator. Um, so, you know, zero, one, two. Um, these can look like many things. We saw many optical flavors in, in, embedded in, in, uh, in, in uh, optics tables and such. But uh, uh, for us, it's, it's typically, it could be on a chip. It could be literally a box or a funny ear shaped box or a really funny shaped box. Um, but we can, we can make single modes in there or we can make many modes. Um, and you also saw some from, from Andrew uh, yesterday and some other different uh, crazy uh, qualities. Um, but uh, so we have these LC oscillators, and, and these are kind of where we can store photons. But of course, if we want interactions, this is not enough. We need, uh, we need something nonlinear. And you, know, you can use lots of different qubits. In, in our lab, we actually are, are uh, we're studying how to make different types of qubits that might have interesting properties. That's one thing we can do with circuits, is we're not stuck to you know, just the you know, enormous library of, of, of God-given atoms. We can, we can make our, our own much worse atoms. Um, uh, but, but actually not, you know, they're, they're, they're much worse in terms of a clock, but actually because they can couple so strongly, they're, they're not really worse in terms of dimensionless numbers. They're, they're actually quite good. Um, and so, uh, but the, the simplest kind of qubit is this, um, you know, is this sort of anharmonic oscillator. So what you do is you just replace the L with a Josephson junction. The Josephson junction, really, you can think of as just being a, a nonlinear inductor. So if you put current through it, the inductance changes a little bit. It gets a little bit smaller. And even for you know one photon's worth of current, which is like a nanoamp, um, it actually shifts by you know a couple percent, maybe five percent or something like that. And so if you put one photon in instead of uh, instead of the next one being the same spacing, it's a little bit less because the inductance has gotten a little bit larger. And so you can either treat you know just ignore all the higher levels and treat this as a qubit, or as we often like to do, is actually use that third level. Um, and, and we can use that as a, as a sort of an auxiliary uh, um, state that we can use for a shelf or for readout or, or other things. Um, and so, so this is kind of, these are kind of the tools in our, in our toolbox. Um, this is what, you know, this is what the equivalent of the optics lab looks like. It's, it's, it's a cryostat, uh, and we just put the sample at the bottom there. It, it's got lots of microwave cables and stuff like that. And, you know, there's all kinds of other things, uh, you know, racks of electronics and things like that, lots of coffee, it's very important. Um, you know, um, okay, so I want to just, I, I realize that when I've talked about this before, I haven't maybe uh, explained sort of the, 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 the bigger vision for, for what we hope to do, and, and so this time I, I thought I would, I would try to do that. So um, in our multi-mode, so what we've done, what, what we do is, you know, we're trying to make a quantum computer that instead of having, you know, some lattice of qubits or something like that, is more actually more like a, a regular computer in a certain sense. So we think of it, we take one, multi, this is, each, each one of these boxes is gonna be a multi-mode cavity and, and there will be a qubit. But there's, you can see that for, you know, there's lots of modes here and, and only a few qubits. And so the idea is we'll have these memory modules which should have, you know, I don't know, tens of modes, uh, something like that. And then each one of those gets a qubit 
um, and then we can have as many modules as we like, and then we can sort of couple them to sort of some kind of a bus resonator, which, which might be single mode or multi mode or, or whatever. And uh, there's, it's a nice architecture because you can kind of, uh, well, for one, our caddies are much better than our qubits, so it kind of makes sense to have more caddies than qubits. Um, it, it also means that we have, the qubits are, thin, you know, caddies are easy to make. We like, literally just machine them out of a block of aluminum. Uh, you know, the, the qubits are not particularly hard to make, but, but they're more work, and they, they also require more control, and, and they're also not as, as good in terms of their quality factors and coherence. Um, and another thing is also in terms of the way that these things are connected. So, so we can, I'll show you in a second how we do this, but you know, we can connect any, any one of these modes to any other mode in just sort of you know, two-ish sort of steps. So, um, and then the other thing is that uh, you know, because these are bosonic modes, there's, you know, a, there's special classes of codes, both, um, you know, um, both autonomous and, and sort of more traditional feedback-based. Um, that, are, that use bosonic modes, that use harmonic oscillators. And, and we can do all those types of modes, like of the type that are being done at Yale, but also, um, it also introduces new modes where we can actually have you know, multi-mode kind of bosonic codes and things like that. And so we're, we're starting to look into that as well. Um, so I just wanted to kind of take you through like how, how this would work. Uh, um, and so these are just some, some operations. So it's kind of a, you know, um, there, there's only, you only actually need to know how a very few number of things work. So, the idea is that uh, we're basically just going to have two types of operations. So we'll have, um, uh, so let's say we want to manipulate like one of these modes. What we do is, you know, at least the simplest way. Maybe we'll come up with more clever ways. But this is sort of you can think of it as a proof that we can sort of do everything that you could possibly want to do. Uh, you, you you take the you take the mode, swap it into the qubit. Um, then it's in the qubit, so you, it's a qubit. You can do whatever you want. You can make any single qubit rotation you like and then you can swap it back. So that's sort of how you can take a harmonic mode, which normally you can't do quantum information processing with, and just do it. You just put it into the qubit, do whatever you want, and go back. And in the meantime, like all these other guys are just sitting there with their excellent coherence time, sort of you know, just uh, not caring. Um, but of course, that's not so interesting. Um, if, if we wanted single qubits, we'd definitely all be using atoms. Uh, if, for, if we want to do two qubit gates, um, then what we need to do is get these modes talking to each other. and that works much in the same way. So we, we again sort of use our favorite swap operation, swap into the qubit. Then we you know just swap the second one also into the qubit. I don't know why it went too far, but it's supposed to be on the same qubit there. Um, and then uh, and then you know and now because the you know because this is a qubit, right? When we put the second one in, it's going to have a different frequency than the first one, and so it, it has a like an on-site interaction. And so uh, you know you can accumulate some phase or do whatever you want, and then uh, and then put them back. And so now you've got a conditional gate, but within a module. Um, and you can also do between modules. So if we want these two to talk to each other, it's, it's basically the same thing. We, we move them into, uh, we just bring them to the same qubit um, via swaps, and then we, you know, and then there's an interaction, and then you, you bring them back. So, uh, so the point here is that you know, without, um, with, with just a little bit of overhead, um, you can basically have any of these guys talk to each other uh, with sort of more or less arbitrary um, connect, uh, connectivity. And, and it's also, a, you know, it's nice because it's really all the same thing. It's all just cavity qubit swaps and qubit rotations. Um, you know, between modules is not really very different from within a module. Um, uh, and it also lets you kind of play with the sort of amount of parallelism you might want. So, I mean, uh, you know, operations within the module share a qubit, so they kind of have to be done in series. But, you know, operations going this way can be done in parallel. And so, you know, what it turn for most of these algorithms that you might want to run, like there's, there's you know, some stuff that you could do in parallel, but mostly it's in series. And so you can kind of tailor, you know, your system to, to what, what you're trying to do. Um, okay, so that's sort of the, you know, the, like the really schematic scheme. So here's our, was our, just our first implementation. So we just have a qubit um, and, and a cavity um, for, and that just, so that would be like your normal circuit QED, just single qubit, single cavity. Um, so that one's for readout, this is your qubit. But now we just couple it to this big chain of resonators. And it, it looks like a chain, so you might think of it as, it's tempting to sort of just think of this as sort of uh, um, uh, um, a chain, but, but really you can see these capacitors are really, really big, and they're so big that really this whole chain sort of hybridizes into phonon modes, basically. And so, so you're really addressing these normal modes directly. So we don't really think of it as addressing this mode or this mode, but we really uh, uh, address the, the normal modes. Um, and I should I should mention you know there was this you know very nice talk yesterday by Hannes about about this idea of having an emitter and then with a delay line and going back and so 
you know, this is really actually very much the same thing. It's just you, 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 know, you put the second mirror on there, um, but still with a finite delay, and you'll get multiple modes, and you can manipulate these things. Uh, um, and, uh, and, I, and I think actually all the metrics are probably the same as well. And so, and in fact, all the things that we have to worry about, I think probably that scheme also has to worry about. Um, so, okay, so the question is, how, you know, how do we get the qubit talking to the, these modes? Um, and, and you know the answer is you know we're going to sort of make a radio basically, um, and what we're going to do is we're just going to we're 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 going to modulate the qubit. Um, and it, we, there's different ways you can modulate the qubit, but in this case we're going to do it. Um, we're just going to modulate the qubit frequency a little bit. And um, if you uh, modulate the qubit frequency, that's actually like you think of the qubit as sort of like your carrier. That's kind of like FM radio. And uh, and you know if you modulate things, what you get is sidebands. Uh, um, but you, know, you remember that you have just a single photon in this qubit, so it's not that you know you have some photons here and some photons here. It's, it's really kind of you know that photon is living in in all of these places. And so, um, if you can make this sideband overlap with um, with some other object, then they're gonna and they're interacting. They'll start to exchange energy. And and this is a very nice way of doing it uh, for reasons uh, that will become uh, clear in a moment. Um, so uh, so this is an example in which. Uh, what we do is we uh, we have a single mode here, uh, and we have a qubit, and then what we're going to do is we're going to modulate it. Uh, actually, this one was done, we, you can also modulate the G directly, which is actually even a little better, uh, which is how we did this one. Um, you can also modulate the frequency, it looks exactly the same. Uh, the And what we're doing is we're, so this is a you know, qubit ground state, qubit excited state, zero photons, one photon, zero photon, one photon in the mode. Um, so this is the, this mode is the is the cavity mode. Um, and this mode is, is the qubit, and you know you, everybody's very used to seeing this. So, you know where, where, where this axis might be a Zeeman shift, or um, it might be a voltage if it's a quantum dot. Um, but here, this is really frequency. It's not it's not like converted from some parameter into frequency. It's actually it's really the modulation frequency that we apply. So that you know it's great whenever you know you can have a frequency versus frequency plot. Um, um, you know because. You know, uh, of all the work that James puts in to make us, you know, these amazing clocks, right? I mean, everything you want to be tied back to frequency. It's the one thing you don't really have to calibrate because you know James is doing it for us. Um, but uh, anyway, so we uh, we uh, so you can do that. You can also do it in the time domain. So you can uh, you can make you just instead of uh, you know sweeping it or something, you just make, you just turn it on here, um, and you'll and you can get um, these oscillations. Which are basically which are vacuum Rabi oscillations essentially between the, the qubit and the mode, but but it's interesting because they're 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 vacuum Rabi oscillations, but even though there's a, still a finite detuning between the, the two two objects, um, and so um, now we can do the, try and do this with multiple modes, um, and uh, and so here's where it really shines because so the protocol is simple we just we just do a pi pulse on, on our qubit. And then we modulate it, and then it's going to get a sideband here. And so, if you were thinking about how you know the way we used to do it is we would just apply like a DC flux pulse to like move the qubit into resonance with, with something, and then move it back out. Um, but if you do that, you'd have to like you know start here and then like sweep up, and you'd have to go through all these levels and somehow not accidentally make a Landau's zener transition that that was unintended. Um, but the nice thing with this is you know the frequency is determined by the frequency at which you modulate. The strength of that sideband is, is determined by the amplitude, and so you can make it just appear here without ever crossing through, and so you can really just make it appear right on top of any modes that you want. So you can really just talk to the thing you want, um, and that's that's another uh, that that's really kind of necessary to get this stuff to work. I mean, in principle, it could be done the other way, but it's it, it would be very challenging. Um, and so what what you see here now is we just. Um, we sweep that frequency, so we're sweeping this, um, that's this axis, and then we're just um, changing the amount of time that, that we sweep for. And what you see is you get all these oscillations for all these different modes. Um, and uh, um, the, the, you know, and uh, they look a little funky, and, and we, we've since fixed that problem. Um, but, but even even here, you can, you can see actually they're, they're still pretty, pretty nice oscillations. Um, and uh, you know, they're very high contrast, they're also pretty quick, so this is only, you know, it's like 50 nanoseconds or something like that. Uh, for for uh, to do a swap, so we can do these swaps very quickly, and we can do it with any of the modes that we want. Um, and so uh, you know, so as I kind of showed in that that diagram before, if you have this mode swapping and the arbitrary rotation, you should be able to do everything that that uh, that you want. Um, uh, and so if we want to do single mode stuff, um, 
we can just do the following protocol. Uh, we first swap the mode. We, we, have a, we start with the qubit empty. We, we, we swap the mode, uh, whatever is in, in a particular mode, into the qubit. Uh, we do some rotation on the qubit. And then we swap it back. So that, that, that will do a single mode operation. And so, um, so we wanted to test how well we could do that. And so we just did that, uh, this thing called randomized benchmarking, which is basically you do a whole bunch of Clifford gates and then make sure that at the end, you, uh, and that you can just calculate where you'll be, and you just make sure you're there at, at the end. Um, and so, um, and, and that kind of amplifies the error, um, so it makes it a little easier to see. And so, if you just do it with the qubit alone, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty good. Uh, I guess, actually, all these numbers are now, we have, we have a new sample. Th these are the published ones, but they're all better now. Um, uh, they're probably about twice as good. But, um, but the, uh, uh, yeah, so anyway, so the transmod is pretty good. Um, and the modes are all kind of between, you know, kind of 90 and 97% or something. And I think we're, we're pushing that up. Um, and I mean, just, I mean, uh, the, in some sense, I mean, and this is a, you know, I guess this is a, uh, one of the challenges is that in some sense, in order to do what we're calling a single qubit gate, we're actually doing what most people would call two, two qubit gates. So that's one reason why it's a little bit harder to get good numbers, but, um, but anyway, nevertheless, it's still pretty good, and we can just check that for all of them, and it, and it works pretty well. Um, so now I wanted to tell you a little bit more about how you actually do the, the two qubit gates. Uh, it's, it's basically what I said before, but I, but I wanted to just sort of show you how it works with the actual energy level. So, so what I've got here is the, so this way is, is qubit excitation, so G, E, F, um, and then up, in, and these are photons. So we've got two modes, and, and we've got every possible two-mode state there, or, or zero and one, so it's a two qubits worth of stuff. And so these are all the possible two qubit states. And so what we'd like to do is a, a CZ gate, um, so, or a C phase gate, which basically is to say that we'd like this one to pick up a minus sign. And, and the key to doing any one of these gates is really just to do something, it actually doesn't even matter which circle you do it to, but let's say do something to this guy that uh, without doing anything to these three, okay? And so I'll show you how we can do that. So first we do, we take the first mode and we swap it into the qubit. So, so that does, that moves these two blobs so that you see if this one is one, then you go to the excited. If it's zero, nothing happens. So we, we can, we do that with our single mode uh, gate. Now we're actually gonna use our F state of our qubit. Um, there are ways to do it without it, but it's convenient since we have it. Um, and we're gonna move now just this guy. Um, so if, uh, uh, if, uh, if this one is there, we'll move it to the F. Um, and that's just another sideband, but now with a, a, a slightly different frequency. And, uh, and so now you can already see we're sort of done, basically, because we've done something to this guy that didn't happen to all the others. And actually, in fact, all we have to do is just keep going. So we just do another, keep more, we just keep the thing on a little longer and make it a two pi pulse. And you say, well, two pi pulse doesn't do anything, but of course it's a spin one half. So it, it actually picks up a minus sign when I do that. If it was a single qubit, you don't care about the global phase, but since these guys are acting as kind of a, a clock reference, uh, you know, you, you can track that phase. Um, and in fact, actually, um, you can make an arbitrary phase too. So if you, if you do a pi pulse and you, you keep going, you'll, you'll get a minus sign. Um, if you come back along a different axis, you can, you can actually pick up any geometric phase you want. So you can actually make it a, a conditional any, any phi you like. Um, some people like C naughts better because it's, I don't know, like phase is confusing or something, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> it's, it's the same thing, but when you get to here, instead of just going back, you, you, you just apply an EF pi pulse to the qubit and then they swap. And then you just go back um, and, then, and then you get a C naught. So this is all fine and good. Um, it's a little bit challenging though because uh, I, I don't want to make it sound like totally easy. There are some challenges, um, you know, you can get dispersive shifts. Um, on these guys, you can get, um, uh, I think it's even worse is these stimulated AC Stark shifts. So when, when you're actually doing the gate, you can get shifts that are state dependent on, on other, other things. There's also you know, some nonlinearities just in the, in the uh, frequency modulation. Um, so anyway, we're, we're working to model these. We, we, we have you know, rough schemes that will work. And I think the only question is, is, is will they slow things down enough that it, it, it's just too annoying? But, but I think I mean, in principle, it's not a problem. But, but uh, we, we have some ideas. Um, uh, yeah, so um, you, can, you can test this out. Actually, that, that's even older. This is like 85% or 90% or something. But uh, you, can, you, can, you can kind of, uh, so one thing, this is actually like 38 different you know, pairs of things. So we can really make any qubit, any, any mode talk to any other mode. Um, and in fact, in fact we can, we, I didn't show it, but we can also 
you know, we can put multiple tones on at once, and then we can actually talk to, you know, like the previous talk, we can actually, some, some, some interactions will become brighter, and some will become subradiant, and, and, and you can also do things like that. Um, and so um, what we're trying to do now is we, we've built, um, uh, 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 you know, out of a hunk of aluminum, uh, 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 a, a box, you know, it's a, it's a box with no seam. So inside is just a rectangular waveguide. But we wanted to do this without having to make it in two pieces. Because when you make it in two pieces at these sort of high cues of 100 million or something like that, that tends to be a dominant loss mechanism. So we, we um, and there's this saying in, in microwaves that, you know, if it's watertight, it'll be microwave tight. And, and that's crap, um, because you can see that th this thing, if I had brought it, I mean, it's like Swiss cheese. You can see through it. But as long as those holes are evanescent, then the, the, the stuff will stay in. That's kind of, you know, uh, for a photonic crystal, people, no one would say if it's, uh, you know, if it's airtight, it's, it's photon tight there. But um, anyway, um, uh, and yeah, and, and so we've gotten really good at making these things. And we can also, like, engineer the dispersion of these modes. So, like, these are perfectly, you know, almost perfectly well sp evenly spaced. and. And they're all very good. So they all like the worst mode is like 600 microseconds, and and many of them are above above a millisecond. So they're all kind of in this 20 to 60 million range. So you have very high cues, um, and that that's how we're mainly hoping to get all those uh, fidelities up. Um, and so anyway, so you know, um, with this part, I mean, you know, again, so this is sort of a bit more, you know, quantum computing. -y, but but I'd like you to think about, you know, we we can really do almost anything with this. We have this one qubit that can, you know strongly interact with any of these modes or make them or mediate interactions between them. And so a good question is uh, what would be interesting states that we can make or, or, uh, or what would be interesting physics we could study. And we have some ideas, of course, but, but I'd, I'd be more curious to, to hear your, your thoughts. Um, so now I, on a slightly different topic. Um, so before we, we kind of, we, we swept, uh, we, we, we drove this one. And this one creates a swap. So you have one excitation either in the cavity or in the qubit. Now what happens if we modulate at this frequency instead? Um, so, so now we're going from, it's a correlated from, you know, from no, Q, no excitations to a pair of excitations in, in the qubit and the, and the, and the uh, cavity or, or any of the modes. And, and, uh, and so, um, and, and this is a very powerful thing because, uh, and, and so at first you might say, well, it should be basically the same. Um, but you can see, actually, it's quite, you know, it, this avoided crossing is quite different. It doesn't really look like just a simple avoided crossing, even though it's just two levels coupled again. Um, you might expect it to be the same, and, and that's because of dissipation. Um, so this cavity, in this experiment, in this particular experiment, the cavity was designed to be very lossy. So, so, it, so, so it, it goes like this, um, but if it, if it stays up in, in this one state for very long, it will just, it'll come down here. And the qubit has a very long decay time, so if it stayed, it, it gets stuck here. So I mean, for the atomic physics people in the audience, they're like, yeah, duh, that's like optical pumping. And it, and, and it, and it is sort of. But um, if you think about it, you know, when, when you do optical pumping with an atom, you, you're, you're relying on the fact that you have sort of two kind of very, you know, two kind of, you know, semi-ground states that are, that are very, very long lived. And then you have some bright state up, up top that you, you can connect them both to. Um, and that's not something, I mean, you. We've made a superconducting qubit that's like that, but that's another talk. Um, but this transmon qubit, the simple one, is basically a harmonic oscillator, right? So, so you know, like you know, g goes to e and e goes to f. You know, there's no like the and, and, and e to f is a stronger transition in general than g to e. So, without any kind of a cavity, you, you actually can't really get with that kind of physics. You can't really do optical pumping. It just doesn't have the right kind of hierarchy of matrix elements or whatever. Um, and so. Uh, um, but but when you do uh, but instead you can you can actually use the cavity to, to stabilize things um, and there's different there's a lot of different flavors with this so and, and actually Andreas has done some really nice things so there's actually from many years ago there's actually a plot which looks almost identical to this one from a uh, from a paper where, where he had developed a, a gate based on a, a two photon version of this and and actually uh, um, this one is done by modulating the G but um, Actually, the data I'll show you next is actually done with this two photon style thing, so it's actually uh, uh, quite related. But anyway, you, you, you get some very interesting physics. We can, ex we, we can simulate all the, yes, did some very nice simulations, and we can also um, sort of, from a sort of flow case standpoint, you know, identify what all these features actually mean. Um, but actually, um, mostly we were, uh, well, um, another thing you can do, though, is uh, actually, so if you just put this blue sideband on, you, it'll, it'll go to the excited state. 
Um, if you actually drive the qubit as well, you can do something that's sort of analogous to coherent population trapping, um, but where there's a sort of a, one of the, mo uh, the, the modes is actually harmonic, so it's a little bit trickier than the standard one. Um, but it works quite well. So, so this is a, um, uh, this is an example of just we're going to decay to, to we're, we're causing it to decay just to this sort of random state over here, um, and you can get and you know you, you can predict how how well it should go and it, it it does pretty well and you can get up to you know ninety plus percentile uh, uh, or percent fidelity kind of pretty much anywhere on the block sphere, um, uh, including including the excited state. So. Um, and it turns out this this is really uh, kind of a key feature for if you wanna if you wanna uh, explore quantum phases, well you you know especially ones that you might not know what they are, um, you want to make it so that there are photons in your system, and uh, and normally as as Jens mentioned, if if you just turn up, if you just leave it alone, it, all the photons will just leave, and you get a very boring ground state. Um, and so uh, so this is actually the thing that John and I have been working on in terms of trying to get, um, uh, you know, trying to, it's actually been the, the main challenge in, in trying to make these sort of strongly interacting uh, lattices of photons. And so, um, so maybe I can tell you a little bit about that work now. And so the, the basic idea is we'd like to make just a very small mod insulator. So um, it turns out it's actually quite easy to make a, a Bose-Hubbard-like model with super connecting um, qubits because a qubit is a Bose-Hubbard site, so it, it, it's literally the way we model it is just a dagger a plus an a dagger a a dagger a term. So, so it's 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 just a Bose-Hubbard site, actually, uh, with a negative u. So it's convenient that that you know Jens spent a bunch of time convincing you that that, that it, it should be the same. Um, and uh, um, we can, actually you can also make qubits that have a positive u if, if you want to do that. It, it, that's that's also possible, but um, but the transmons tend to have a negative u. Anyway, so we, we put a chain here, and then uh, and then what we're going to do is essentially, uh, uh, well, first we'll play with it a little bit just to show you that we, we have everything working, and then then we'll uh, actually drive it such that it, it will uh, um, be stabilized by this this particularly lossy resonator. Um, right, so um, first, though, you know, just do we have a chain? Is it is it all coupled and talking to each other? So what we can do here is we can. Um, so we have four sites, we just put one photon, uh, you know, we, so one way we can control this thing is sort of what people have typically done in, in, in um, you know, these sort of photon or, or circuit-based uh, quantum simulation things is you, you, you know, you, you use the fact that you can really control the thing fully and just prepare whatever state you want, you put it in some state, you, and then you just let the dynamics evolve, um, you know, quick enough that, that, you know, dissipation isn't a big factor at least, right? So, so here's a sort of a very simple kind of quantum lock. So you, you put a single photon into site zero, and then you just let it propagate. And of course, it just kind of hops around, basically. It's, it's a wave. It just, you know, just kind of does what a wave does and you know, goes back and forth. Uh, and it's pretty consistent with this. Uh, and you can sort of see that there's some dissipation. It eventually dies. Um, and, you know, and, and the problem is, like, right, I mean, this is sort of the generic problem with doing these things is that in the end, you're always, the question is, have, has your system internally thermalized um, before things really thermalize and end up in the ground state, which is just no photons, which is boring. Um, and so, uh, what we'd really like to do is to is to have it such that you know we have kind of a you know maybe a driven but an equilibrium in which it's it's like a, a normal system where there's sort of a chemical potential injecting things. But, but of course, you know, for photons, that um, if you don't do anything special, they will just decay. So, um, so what we've done here is we're we're going to use this kind of optical pumping idea. And just uh, we're going to drive this transition. It'll decay to here, and it, it'll be happy here because this this decay time is long. And then, of course, if you, if you couple this site into the chain, it will just you know um, uh, spread. And so you know you kind of expect it to do something like you know it'll wander around, and you know it's just going to keep filling up because every time this thing hops over here, it just get it goes down to here. It gets very quickly refilled. Um, and so that's kind of what we hope to happen. Um, and so now we can we can. We can actually look at what happens. Um, so, so um, basically, you, you get something that looks like this. So you you just turn on this drive, and then the thing just sort of all the different sites sort of just fill up. And you, you can kind of plot this versus uh, you know the drive the tuning uh, uh, um, from that transition and, and how strongly you drive it. And when we're still you know trying to understand this in detail, but the gist of it is if you drive within sort of about uh, J about the tunneling of the uh, of the of the stabilizing transition, 
um, you'll you'll uh, you'll actually start to fill up the, these sites, and so um, and, and it's nice because you know you you can just, you just wait and, it, and it's there, and you don't have to wait particularly long. And and we believe uh, one thing we're also trying to work out, uh, but what we believe is that in some sense that if you optimize fully over this kind of dissipated preparation protocol, it should be <coughs> the same fidelity as what you would get from just sort of trying to just prepare that state, um, you know, with, with, with you know, um, coherent pulses. Um, but of course, you know, you don't have to know in advance what it is exactly. You just have to, um, in fact, the only, the only thing that, uh, that you really need to Can have you it. Can shown in that phase diagram plot? What is that? Oh, data? yeah, so th this is the, this is the, so, this is the probability of, of one of the sites um, uh, being excited. So red is excited, or one photon, I should say, um, uh, probably of one. And uh, and then this is the uh, um, this is the, the tuning of uh, you know from, from this transition, uh, and then um, and then this is just how how strongly we're driving basically. Um, so so in some sense, this is the refilling rate of the of the one site, and this is the. Uh, um, the tuning, and so as long, as, basically, essentially, as long as you're, so, and sometimes this is where you're injecting the, the photons at what energy you're injecting them. And, and why this is it red twice? That that is a good question, and I don't think we've figured this 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 pump out yet. Um, but uh, um, yeah, so so this part kind of is what you would expect, and and the the shift also kind of makes sense because um, you're it's actually a two photon process, and so you actually start shift the levels a little bit, so. So I think you expect that when you turn up the drive, that it, it, it kind of renormalizes so a little do you, bit. Do you drive photon pairs? Is that just measuring you on the, the, uh, on the site with your pumping? Uh, it, it, is, the, is this you? I, mean, um, I, I don't think so, because U is more like 300 megahertz or something like that. So, so I mean, it, you divide by two, but I, I, I don't think that quite matches. I mean, I would say this is more on the scale of J, but, but I, I the data is still relatively fresh, so I, I wouldn't say I'm, we're not totally sure yet. Uh, yeah, and, uh, and actually, so, so we also have now made an eight-site version of this, and, and it, that's just starting to work as of like last week or something like that. And so it's actually filling a little bit um, better, and we can still fill. And you can kind of see that the, the sites closer to the thermalizer are filling a little bit better, but they're all doing not uh, terribly. And again, this is not terribly optimized. We, we think that we should still be able to do better. Um, and, and you know, and you know, you know. So we, we already have, of course, some plans of you know we, we should be able to look at holes or doublons or um, and and and, uh, and and kind of play many of the games that were played with the uh, atomic uh, mod insulators when they first made them. Uh, and of course, in the long run, what we'd like to do is take these ideas and, and uh, combine them with the sort of pictures I showed before these topological. Uh, circuits um, to make fractional quantum Hall type systems. The, the same type of stabilization that you, uh, you use here should work there, <coughs> although the gaps are a little smaller. But um, so yeah. So anyway, um, but I'm very curious to, to to see you know or to talk about any ideas you have for interesting physics that can be done in, in sort of 1D, where I mean we have sort of this 1D gas microscope and. Uh, what should we do with it? Uh, should we, uh, 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 or what should we, you know? And we we can also make other things. We can make we could probably make a ladder or or, or other things as well. Um, and I just thought I'd mention just some other stuff that's going on in our lab. Uh, um, you know, we're we're also working on kind of protected qubits. So it's like an of these two. So um, so this one is protected against T1, but not T2, and you can get tens of milliseconds or ten milliseconds ish. <coughs> This should be, in principle, protected against fluctuations in both, uh, you know, against charge noise, flux noise, and relaxation. Um, this is something we're working on with, with Jens and, and Andrew Hauck. Um, uh, we're, we're, we're still working actually on our electrons on helium, and, and we, we, we're doing pretty well. We actually we think we see single electrons now. Uh, in term, another kind of interesting mini-body thing, which is related to everything here, is, is kind of autonomous error correction. So we, I showed you we could stabilize single qubit states, and we've done that experimentally, but uh, we also have some theoretical ideas for how to stabilize not just um, a single state, but actually a manifold of states and, and, and to protect the coherence uh, within that manifold. Um, and then and we're also doing uh, some fun sort of superconducting Rupert hybrid stuff with, with John, as well, as well as some other things as well. Um, so just, uh, you know, uh, Dan had sort of uh, tasked us with, you know, trying to stimulate some some discussion, and so these are just some random questions, you know, uh, about things that, you know, 
be interested in, uh, you know, uh, think what, what, you know, most of it are like, you know, we have, we have a lot of cool tools and it would be great to, to get more <laughs> ideas. And it's not that we don't have any ideas, right? We have plenty of things to do. We're, we're, we're busy, but, but, uh, but uh, you, you guys have a different background and I would be very curious to learn anything that, that excited you about, um, about what we can do with these systems. Uh, and then uh, I, I can kind of conclude. Um, so, you know, we have, I think these, these many uh, multi-mode systems are very promising, uh, I think, it, both in the atomic and the circuit context. Uh, um, you know, I think we can really do a lot with this stabilization, and it seems like we can not just stabilize single states, but really uh, uh, many body <coughs> states. Um, and, and, uh, and, I, and I think we can really start to do some of these experiments that previously were only accessible to atomic physics experiments, but, but I think can work very well now and, and potentially even with, uh, with competitive or maybe even better figures of merit in any cases. And we're doing lots of other stuff, so I think these are actually things I learned on the previous slide, but other, other questions too. So. so um, a question about the, the, the stabilization of the modern slayer. So yeah. if I was worried that um, that I wanted to ask if I wanted to ask questions about ground states of interacting systems, mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to start with something that was very low entropy. Mm -hmm. um, how does the, the the fact that this the p metric was not unity affect one's ability to do that? Can I think about the non unity p as like a temperature of the system? Yeah, I think you know in the same sense that like when Marcus does his gas microscopes, if he's got holes, right, that's sort of a form of temperature. Uh, that's one of the things they're trying to work on. I think. Okay. I think so it's that's like entropy. Like yeah, and I think, oh, and of course, one of our main goals is to try to get that number as high as possible. And so, I, what are the? So it's, it's about a factor of five percent or ten percent off. So, what is the main issue? So, I mean, we we think that like from a like if you just like sort of say, well, you optimize things numerically and then you put in the numbers, it really only depends on like. The anatomicity, like the U-term, and, and 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 the decay rates, and so from that perspective, we should have like 98 or, or better percent uh, things. So, but I think you know, but like there's a lot of, I mean, some of it may actually have to do with like how we're reading it out, because like what we do, the way the way that I mean, maybe I should have said this, but the way that we re actually read this out is we kind of, um, you know, uh, we, we 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 pull all the, you know, so we have a readout on every site, um, and and then what we do is we we flux two in the qubits out of resonance with each other very quickly. So we sort of just move them all to different spots and then we, and then we can read them out. So we kind of, which is sort of like, you know, I, don't know, I guess making the last super deep or something like that and then trying to read it out. And, and, uh, and but you know, when we do that, uh, you know, for example, it, it's possible that these couplings aren't that small and so it's possible that you can actually get some funny dynamics where things move around in ways which are kind of systematic and annoying. And so we're, we're still kind of working that out. And, also, I mean, we're still optimizing over the over the parameters. Like, it, you know, the, I think they're. It's not terribly sensitive to like, you know, what, what how what the coupling is, or or how strong you're coupled to this, uh, you know, uh, dissipative bath. Um, but it does it does matter. So so I mean, we're we're still kind of optimizing over those sorts of things. So I think it's mostly that kind of stuff. But, but we'll again, like especially on this one, it's like a week old. So we're, we're you know. Like in fact, like uh, yeah, this, this I think last week it was like here. So, you know, it's going up. If, if, it, if it keeps going up at this rate, we'll be at like two hundred percent, which is bad. So actually, no. So we, 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 we want to be at one. And, and I should mention, we I didn't plot it here, but but we do also measure. We 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 don't just measure the the population in the ground state and the excited state. We also measure measure the population in the second excited state. So we can actually tell if there's a double on there or um, directly. So it's not it's not just like a parity measurement or, or, or a single state measurement. Um, and that's pretty low. We have probably have time for one or two more questions. Oh. So there's this weird uh, the symmetry in, in the couplings between the qubits, it seems, or there's uh, the, the spacing seems not to be identical. I, I They look being passively coupled to each other yes. along this chain, and, and then the between the first and second one is different. Yeah, they are capacitively coupled. Um, yeah, this is a uh, this is kind of an artifact. Uh, so, they're like like I said, there's there's different ways you could do this this thermalization, this particular you know, to do the stabilization. There's different ways you can do it. Um, 
So you you know you can do it um, in sort of uh, um, you know this two photon way um, that we are doing it, um, and that uses one site. The, the, there was another thing we were thinking about. It turns out like if you if you kind of drive this qubit, if you if you position this qubit relative to this qubit in the right way and drive it, you can also get uh, you can get something where you basically put in a pair of photons, like one that goes this way and one that goes this way. So it's like we call it like a two site thermalizer. And so I think this was originally designed to be able to support that mode, which is sort of more complicated and probably uh, uh, not ideal for this. So, so that's why that's different. And that may also be a little bit why some of these are not as good as they could be. Um, yeah, so there's probably like a lot of little, little things that you can do. I mean, the nice thing is actually that it's, it's sort of not particularly sensitive I and mean, it kind of works pretty well anyway. Are, are there any strategies for doing interactions between the, the qubits? Um, they are interact. Well, I mean, you know, it, it, I guess it depends on, on what you know. This is something that John and I always are, are, are going back and forth about, like what is an interaction and what's not. So, so I mean, or in your Hubbard model, does yeah, the Hubbard model yeah. interact. Yeah. So, so I mean, in the Hubbard model, it's on-site interactions, yeah. right? And so, yeah, a question would be, how could you get um, off-site interactions without sort of accompanying real tunneling or something like that? And that's that's something we've been thinking about. And, and, and if you have ideas. Uh, you know, we, we would be interested in because I think I think that would be I mean there, there yeah I mean we have some ideas but I wouldn't say we have we nothing that we're actively pursuing yet because we're not maybe happy with them yet so uh, quick, quick. so would you just comment because you tune all these qubits into resonance I suppose yeah. on sort of the fe technical feasibility you went from four to eight to eight is yeah. it easy to just tune them all in resonance with flux tune I mean sixteen. Yeah, you know, I mean, this is, this is, a, this is a, one of these things too, because I, I don't know, I, like in the you know, sort of in quantum computing, right? We're like, okay, let's make one and make it perfect, and make two and make it perfect, and like maybe yeah, three. You know. but, uh, and John's like, no, no, you have to have like a lot of them because it's like, you know, yeah, because yeah, they're supposed to be like atoms or something. And uh, and so yeah, no, we, we just said let's just try it. So it wasn't terrible. I mean, it wasn't too bad. I mean, it, it, I mean, maybe maybe Alex would have a different opinion of it, but but. Uh, um, but no, I mean, it seems like it. You know, it, it takes a little bit of time, and and there there are some weird things about it. But it, you know, it's basically you have to just calibrate an end by end matrix, and it's, it's not that bad. Is the gist of it? So yeah, no, I don't think there's any problem going to like sixteen or twenty or something like that. Okay, let's thank David one more time.